Okay, great. So yeah, we were saying that you know people responded to the gospel while the preacher was still preaching and the holy spirit was poured out so we are clear that it is the lord jesus who is the baptizer um and i remember one incident it was a mission trip that we had taken from apc bangalore uh and we had gone for a conference where people were people had joined from so many different states in india and uh pastor uh, pastor ashish was sharing on the holy spirit and at the end of the meeting because the crowd was huge uh you know he said why don't we all stand up and we yes we can trust that we will be baptized in the holy spirit when we, others lay hands on us but even if nobody lays hands on you where you're standing if there's no one to lay hands on you go ahead and believe that you will be baptized in the holy spirit and people did that and after that session when he asked how many of you were baptized in the holy spirit there were hundreds and hundreds of hands you know that were being waved across the auditorium and uh, many of them were not even touched by another human being to lay hands and pray for them but like this cornelius's household the holy spirit fell on them and you know they were they received the gift of the holy spirit so um, you know this is so encouraging can i pray for holy spirit baptism for someone whom i cannot touch for whatever reason okay maybe they are far away at that time or you are praying on the phone for them can they still be baptized yes they just need to believe they need to believe to receive the outpouring of the holy spirit okay so that is something we saw in cornelius's family then what else now let's continue so we were at verse 44 uh, when we said that the holy spirit fell then later on uh, when the holy spirit falls what is the other common feature that we we observe speaking in tongues so these people were also speaking in tongues and they were magnifying god then now peter is asking see usually what is the usual scenario you have people believing and then they are baptized in water but in this case holy spirit baptism is happening first so again another question people ask should uh i first get baptized in water or first get baptized in holy spirit see it immediately after one is born again we follow the example of the lord jesus and we follow the instruction of the lord jesus which is to be baptized in water now this is something we plan and we go ahead for that but holy spirit baptism it can happen before or after there is no issue right it's no issue like in my own life i remember i got born again as a child and then i went for uh, some crusade my mother took me for some crusade there the preacher was preaching about holy spirit baptism and said uh, those of you who believe you will be able to receive it and you will start speaking in a new language and i just believed and i started praying in tongues but it wasn't until i think i finished almost did i finish college i don't know but uh, maybe i was in, in college only at that time somebody taught us about water baptism so water baptism happened much later holy spirit baptism happened first so it's not a uh, you know it's not right or wrong this first that next but we must teach the believer right that yes you must be baptized in water repent and be baptized um but also teach them about the holy spirit baptism and god doesn't you know necessarily worry about the order what comes first now peter also he says look now that god has been so faithful to the gentiles he began by saying i know i perceive that god shows no partiality god accepts everyone as the same so now again he says look 
how can i stop these people who have been baptized by the holy spirit how can i stop them from being baptized in water in the name of the lord i can't do that because god has approved them by pouring his spirit so he then next thing is he commands these people to be baptized in water also so both the baptisms commonly we see in the uh, acts of the apostles water baptism baptism in the holy spirit both of these are done the order you know we are not specifying you know this before that or anything like that so this is the story at cornelius's house any thoughts any questions about these matters if you have you can ask we will answer and then proceed water baptism holy spirit baptism okay it's all clear great great okay sure sure all right so we have observed you know how the gospel now went to the gentile people and this was also a mighty plan of god he is the director remember he is directing the gospel to go out to various communities and that is the greatness about Cornelius's family that it was a gentile family okay something different that god was doing and who is god doing this through somebody like peter he he first when he saw the dream he said no 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 god i will not touch anything unclean so as a jew he is very rigid about what one must do and what one must not do that's how the jews were remember when uh, the lady uh, uh, who's who's not a jew she came to jesus and asked for healing jesus said the the bread of the children will not be given to the dogs so that was the strictness of how uh, the ministry was mainly for the jews but after jesus went on the cross the gospel was made available to everybody right so that is the that is the difference while jesus was alive and after jesus died on the cross after jesus died on the cross god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so jesus is for the whole world salvation is for the whole world it's for all the communities and that is what we see happening in the acts of the apostle it's going out it's going out and it is going out you know it's a little bit funny because it's going out through a person like peter who is very rigid in his uh, convictions okay so now this has already happened now let us see now the apostles and the brethren who were in judea heard that the gentiles had also received the word of god so the uh, the christian circle at this point they were not yet called as christians but you know the believers the circle of the believers they were quite uh, well informed about what is going on here and there and everywhere so people heard that the gospel had already gone out to the gentiles they heard the word of god and when peter came to jerusalem okay so now peter is traveling and all he was in simon the tanner's house but what is the base church jerusalem church so he's coming back to the base church and usually when they come back they will report they'll say all these things happened god did all these mighty things in my missionary uh, journeys i met these people shared the word of god and all so he goes back and he tells the others in jerusalem this is what god did i went to cornelius's house so what kind of a response did he get they were also jews they were also passionate devout jews they were not at all happy about peter going to the house of a gentile person okay so it says those of the circumcision so those of the circumcision refers to the jews they contended with him contended is like kind of opposing right and arguing and saying how could you how could you go to the gentiles you went into uncircumcised men and ate with them 
So the Jews were very proud of their, uh, you know, their, their status, uh, their, their covenant with God, and the others were low for them. And these Jews in Jerusalem, they were very unhappy that Peter, you have gone to the Gentiles. Not only did you go to their house, you also ate with them. You know, eating is a sign of fellowship. You don't eat with, you know, anybody. You eat with people who you relate to. So we don't relate to the Gentiles. How could you eat with them? You know, they were unhappy with Peter. But now Peter has to help them understand what God did in his heart and in his life. So he goes through the entire vision. So from verse 4 to verse 15, you see him narrating the same thing. He says, look, this is what happened. Okay, I will tell you from the beginning, everything I'll tell you. So I was in Joppa, Simon Tanner's house. I was hungry. I went into a trance. I saw a vision. There was this, uh, uh, you know, there was a sheet. It had clean, unclean animals. Then God said, okay and i told god no i won't do it so he explained himself it was not me it was not me but god said you know why are you calling uh some things as common and unclean you know you just rise up kill and eat it so then he kind of connects that with the three men who came asking for him uh, and then he went along with them because the spirit told him you go doubting nothing so he explains all these things and he says so uh i went to their house uh and i preached to them and then you know as i spoke the holy spirit fell upon them upon as upon us at the beginning so he tells them remember the uh uh time when we were waiting in the upper room and suddenly and suddenly right suddenly the there was a sound of a rushing mighty wind and then the holy spirit was poured out on them so he says look why are you blaming me i'm not responsible god told me to go so i went and suddenly if god pours out his holy spirit on these people how am i responsible you know when god has accepted them we should not reject them so basically uh, peter is giving them this uh, clarity that it is god's work he is touching the lives of the people who are we to stop god from doing what he is doing aren't we supposed to be obedient to the promptings of god in our life so he explains like this okay and then he adds to it about the holy spirit baptism he says see look john he baptized with water, but uh, like the Holy Spirit baptism, right? Holy Spirit baptism is something that Jesus said that we would all receive. So if God gave that same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus, who was I that I could withstand God? So, you know, he's saying, let God do his work as a minister of God. I have to move in the direction of the leading of God. I cannot, you know, put up my preferences and biases and, uh, uh, you know, uh, like, you know, sometimes we have all, all these uh, preferences personal preferences that we have for example i'll just give you some examples okay for example if i am the kind i don't like young people and when i'm doing my church ministry i don't give them much importance i feel oh they are so rebellious they are so uh, you know they are so worldly uh, they don't listen so don't waste time on the young people. Let us have most of our ministries for adults. Let us have our ministries for children. It's my personal bias. I don't like young people. Okay. But if I'm a true minister of God and I'm being led by the spirit of God, maybe God puts some things in my heart and says, you do it for the young people. As a true minister, I can't say, no, God, I don't like young people. So my personal preference and my bias should not stop me from spreading the word to the people that God is bringing in my life. 
I just give you one example. Now, it could be possible that the I stopped God's work because of my attitude. And I said, no, I will not. Let, let them go. Let them go. There are a lot of programs going on in the city. Let them go there. Right? I could stop God's work. I can delay what God wants to do. Or I can be somebody who puts aside my personal preference. I say, okay, I don't like them, but God is telling me, let me do it. Now, this can be applied for, you know, maybe languages. We don't like people of certain languages. Or it could be that we like people only who speak our language. But when God is leading us to minister without partiality to people of all languages, we should be open to doing that. Or how about, you know, a certain background, people who uh, have this kind of education, we prefer them. People who are not so educated, we don't prefer them. So there is a bias, right? So what we understand here is our bias, we should be willing to lay it aside. Or let's say as a woman, you know, I might prefer only to minister to women. I might not trust men, right? Like, why should I trust this brother to do the ministry? What if he, uh, you know, uh, does more harm than good? Bias. I might think, no, if I put one lady in charge, she will do a better job. So it's a gender bias, which I have. God is not a God with biases and partiality. So as ministers of God, we have to be uh, open to minister to all kinds of people and never feel that, you know, uh, my personal preference is more important. When we do that, we will get stuck. Okay. So beyond personal preferences, we must minister. So that's how Peter is explaining and he's saying, look, how could I withstand God? I can't stop God. No, as a true minister, I have to flow in the direction. And Holy Spirit was flowing in the direction of the Gentiles. So I did. I moved in that way. They heard all the things. They gave their life to God. Uh, and God has granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. So he, he explains everything to them. And, uh, you know, hopefully a lot of them uh, would have been comforted by what exactly happened. Okay. So that is the account of Peter ministering to the Gentiles and mainly through the family of Cornelius. Now, did Cornelius take the gospel to many people from his community? Yes. That's how the gospel spreads, right? So God is gaining entrance into lives of people, lives of communities, lives of nations, uh, you know, and, and he is touching people's lives. Now, at that time, we also said that there was a lot of persecution going on. So people, because of persecution, what happened? They got scattered. Why did people get scattered because of persecution? Any idea? Why would they want to get scattered? Any thoughts on that? Come on, you must have some thoughts, no? Why people got scattered? Hey, class, you're there or? Okay, Arena is saying no idea. 
Okay. So, uh, yeah. See, you just think about it. If we are ministering in a certain place and the work of God is going on very well, uh, and if there is persecution, okay, and uh, seems like there was pretty severe persecution, um, you know, people being, we saw how Saul was harassing the people, right? Even physically beating them up, dragging them to the prison. So it was uh, scary. But at the same time, if you recall, you know, when Paul was not accepted and people were uh, very uh, cautious about, uh, you know, Saul, who, who had converted, um, the believers in Damascus, what did they do? They made him escape, okay, from the opposers. So it could be that the work was going on powerfully, but because of a threat to one's life, because of the, uh, you know, challenges which they were facing, it would have been safer for them to go and live in another place. So because of that, people were getting scattered. So, you know, they would try to find a safer place and uh, maybe spread the gospel there so what what do you think is it a is it a godly thing to to keep yourself safe from persecution or is it a cowardly thing like when you try to escape persecution, is it ungodly? What do you, what are your opinion? Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, sometimes, uh, even Jesus said when people are not accepted, please Correct. move on. We don't yeah. dare. Yeah. So yeah. when increase, the, there is no point because people are so and hardened hearted. It's quite difficult. We have to see the God thing. We have to move from that place. That's, uh, I think. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for, for uh, uh, you know, sharing those thoughts. Yeah, it makes complete sense, right? If, um, I mean, Jesus did say that when they persecuted him, they will persecute his followers. But this does not mean that we walk right into danger. Okay, now, when we are doing God's work and there is no other way and persecution happens, that is different. That is different. We have to face it. We can't run away from it. But if there is an opportunity for us to escape, why not? Because if we die or are seriously harmed, how will we be useful for the kingdom of God? Isn't it? You know, uh, so it is okay to escape. It's not an ungodly thing at all. In fact, uh, when we saw in Acts chapter 9 and verse 25, uh, we said, okay, I'll read from 23 to 25. Okay, Acts 9. One second. Yeah, let me post it here in our chat section. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down through the wall in a large basket. So you see the wisdom that God gave the disciples and Saul and Jesus and the believers. When persecution was high, there's nothing wrong with trying to save your life. If you can, then save it. But if you can't, someone like Stephen, he stood there and he knew he could not escape. And he knew that he's going to enter into the presence of God. right? So he fought for it in that way and he became a martyr. So there is a place for both of these things. 
if there is an option to be safe it's okay you know we can go to a safer place and do the ministry but be led by god you know it shouldn't be like you run away from god's purpose so that's the point now when we read that people were scattered that's what it means they try try to find a safer place and this is a time when persecution arose over stephen okay and that was not a simple matter you know stephen had died in such a public way and at that time many believers were being imprisoned and physically harmed so it was quite severe so they scattered they tried to find safer places and we are told that they went as far as phoenicia cyprus antioch but here is the beauty see when there is water in the sponge okay have i am sure you all have experimented with sponges you dip it in water it's full of water now if you want to carry it from the bucket you know to a distance you remove the sponge it will be dripping with water wherever you carry it there will be water coming out of the sponge till such time that the sponge is completely dry so it makes the trail wet you know that path becomes wet the believers they were born again they were filled baptized with the holy spirit and passionate about god so when they were scattering what was happening they were like the sponge with water wherever they went preaching the word to but you know they still did not have the understanding that they could preach to the gentiles so they were true to whatever they knew they knew that it can be preached to the jews so they preached but most important thing is they preach the word okay and also think about this when they were persecuted uh, maybe let's say a believing couple in jerusalem church oh but persecution is increasing why don't you leave this place go somewhere else they go they may not have a pastor going with them or you know some elder from church going with them it's just them they might have attended uh, church for uh, you know a year and learned some basic things but that doesn't stop them from preaching and sharing about the love of god about the power of the holy spirit right so ordinary believers from the church of jerusalem and you know the early church we're just saying early church to include people in the region because there was persecution all over the region all these people were capable of sharing the word isn't that amazing you know today if we all get scattered will the gospel go to new people new communities new families it's a question if we are like the early church believers filled with the spirit you know passionate about the gospel then yes it will go otherwise what will happen we'll just go ah i found a safer place that's it but early church is not like that they are so passionate if you send me to nepal i will preach the gospel in nepal if you send me to bhutan i will preach the gospel in bhutan if you send me to you know bangladesh i will preach the gospel in bangladesh if you send me to india i will preach the gospel in india wherever they are going they don't mind they are just sharing their life they are sharing the truth that they have learned the gospel which has changed their life the power of god supernatural power of god which they have experienced they are sharing with others so that is the passion with which you know they were scattered but was it an advantage in in a sense for the church very much persecution is not a good thing but you know god can use even that which is meant for evil for our good as we say in romans 8:28 all things work together for good how can persecution be good yes it is evil but god used it for good the believers who were scattered took the word 
and they preached all over the place all over the place so then what more people came to know about christ so could you remember gamaliel he said if this is a work of man it will end but if this is a work of god we cannot stop it this is a work of god even in persecution it is spreading right so can persecution stop the word from going out answer is no even persecution cannot stop the word from going out to the people that's what we see in the early church okay now let's continue there were some people uh, they were from cyprus and cyrene they when they came to this place called antioch okay there are two antiochs in uh, the book of acts don't get confused this antioch is where the church was uh, the uh, you know the church was planted uh, where you see later you know saul comes there uh, i mean now we'll call him paul his roman name paul and barnabas they minister in this antioch okay so this uh, church it is said uh syrian syrian antioch okay they we'll call it syrian antioch because there's another antioch of pisidia which we will talk about later but this church was planted in syria okay so some people from cyprus and cyrene again notice it doesn't say some pastors or some leaders it could have been ordinary believers who planted such a uh, prominent church the syrian antioch church so they came here they spoke to the hellenists remember we said greek speaking jews so they spoke to them preaching the lord jesus what did peter preach to cornelius the lord jesus how were so many people giving their lives to christ preaching the lord jesus you know sometimes when people are not coming to christ we can also ask the question are we preaching jesus because if we are preaching jesus it will make an impact so the message of the early church so clear the message is preaching christ what is the mission go to the ends of the earth so they are willing to go and they are preaching jesus and the hand of the lord was with them and a great number believed and turned to the lord wow you know for uh, any of the pastors uh, this statement is such a blessing it's not see ministry is not in numbers we agree with that uh, everything we do for the lord is important even if you are ministering to only one person it is uh, what god calls us to do so that's okay but you know our heart is to see many lives touched isn't it so time and again in the book of acts we see that peter stood up and preached 3000 were added uh, they preached uh, you know at uh, solomon's porch so many people heard uh, the miracle happened so many people believed samaria so many people believed again great number believed and turned to the lord so whatever is happening good or bad scattering persecution uh, anything whatever is happening miracle ha is happening a great number believed and turned to the lord so i told you throughout the book of acts it's like that forest fire right so a lot of people coming to know christ like a revival is taking place uh, and uh, you know it grows it grows uh, and uh, several people actually come to give their lives to the lord yeah okay so that is a little bit about how the uh, antioch church came about so now as this church was gaining prominence and the work of god around the region was gaining prominence remember i told you the news spread quite fast so the jerusalem church heard about it and what was the practice of the jerusalem church it see it's like apostolic okay what is apostolic apostolic is when uh, uh they provide oversight okay and uh, the leadership provides oversight they provide uh, support for governing the new churches uh, they help 
mature the the new churches right uh, any other doctrinal issue they are ready to help so a lot of support coming in from the elders or the more mature uh, ones or the the apostles so when they hear about all these churches and especially about the syrian antioch church they send barnabas okay to go to antioch from jerusalem when he came uh, it says he saw the grace of god he was glad so that basically tells us that the church was doing well uh, there was uh, good growth happening in the lives of the people individual people as well as uh, you know the church at large it was really blessed and it made him happy right obviously we want to see a healthy church a church which is passionate for christ where people are growing in god the church itself is growing and the church is making an impact for the gospel so seems like the antioch church was all this and so barnabas was very happy and he what did he do see barnabas is a uh, also known as the encourager so he used to encourage people so he encouraged them the antioch church uh, that they should continue right they should continue uh, with the lord with purpose of heart or in other words the church should keep growing and they should keep fulfilling what god has called them to do so he encourages them and uh, uh, you know he uh, sees that people are added so when barnabas goes to do ministry in the antioch church what happens again you read there a great many people were added to the lord so you know it was a blessed time it was a blessed time people are constantly being added people are uh, coming to know the lord jesus okay now for whatever reason barnabas he feels that in this antioch church how about you know we we invest right in the word of god how about we equip the people some more so what does barnabas do it's we are told that he goes to tarsus who is there in tarsus we talked about somebody earlier who went off to tarsus who is that his name itself you know this place is associated with his name who of tarsus okay cut and saul saul of tarsus correct so saul had fled or he had uh, gone into hiding hiding in the sense he was doing ministry there but he did not want to be uh you know in other places where the jews were plotting to kill him so he had got under cover but barnabas he had a heart for saul okay and here in acts chapter 11 he goes looking for saul why maybe god put it in his heart you know if let's say it was peter and god told peter go and find saul of tarsus you know, we are not sure peter was the kind that god had to convince him even to go to the gentiles he got a vision and then you know he went but barnabas on the other hand seems to be a person who is very open right to uh serving with those who are not like him so barnabas i told you earlier he is an encourager he goes to tarsus to find saul because he would have heard that ah in these regions after so many years you know saul continues to do good ministry now nearly i mean definitely over a decade 
you know, when you do the calculations, uh, it's like, I don't know, 14 years or something like that. Uh, that more than 14 years, actually, that Saul had been serving God, but not in the uh, public view. So Barnabas probably had an idea that this man of God is faithful and can be trusted, right? Uh, initially, yes, everybody doubted whether uh, Saul was was a sincere person, okay? Because he was a persecutor turned into a preacher. But now, after several years, I'm sure Barnabas was clear that this person would be useful for the work of the ministry. So he goes, he searches for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch, okay? Understanding his ministry. So, you know, this shows us also partnership, right? Partnership, we spoke about kingdom building, where we must allow others to step into our vision. We may think that I'll do it. I don't want anybody. God has given me this church. I will preach till I die. Okay, I'm not going to allow anyone to share the word. But that's not how it works. You know, in the church of Antioch, a beautiful thing that we notice is team ministry, where it's not just one person. You know, it's not just a Barnabas, or it's not just the initial leaders of uh, the Antioch church. But now who comes into the picture? Saul. Okay, so he is brought to Antioch. And once he was brought to Antioch, we are told it was a whole year. They assembled with the church and taught a great many people. So think together with me. You know, these believers must have been very passionate for God. But we always find the leaders in Jerusalem trying to find out, okay, what are all the things the people don't know? They don't know about Holy Spirit baptism. Okay, come, Peter, John, let's go to Samaria. Let's baptize them in the Holy Spirit. Let's, you know, speak about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Or what are the doctrines these people don't know? So they would have understood the spiritual need of the Church of Antioch. Barnabas would have understood and he would have thought, okay, let me partner with Saul. We both are going to get together for one year. Look at that. One year, churches assembly taught a great many people. So, so many different subjects, teaching, equipping, you know, you have your something like, you know, I'm just saying like our APC, weekend school, conference, seminar, this, that, classes, Bible college classes, equip, 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 right? So the people are being equipped for an entire year. Barnabas and Saul are engaging in teaching the people. How does teaching the people help? How does it help? Do you think it helps? Yes. Okay. How? Okay. So that says yes. Okay. So maybe you want to share from your own experience how learning has helped. Anyone? Briefly, anything that, uh, you know, I, I know all of you, this is the third year of learning. For one year, the believers in Antioch were taught. Three years, y'all are learning. How does it make a difference to your spiritual walk with God? Reaching out to the lost. Okay. okay. It equips you to reach out to the lost. True, true. Yeah. How has it helped you in your personal walk, your ministry? Okay. 
okay i'm just asking siddharth anything if you are comfortable to share uh, from where you are how do, how does learning help you in your personal journey in your ministry it helps to grow personally man like mm -hmm. my spiritual life to the I mean to grow closer to god it helps me okay. to grow like personally okay. okay okay sure thank you thank you so it helps one grow personally okay great great um yeah how about the others we prince or thomas kanan how does learning help you okay so you know new revelation right on so many things we don't know we are not aware maybe we know uh, about you know we know about the gospel uh, but oh, and maybe we are baptized in the holy spirit also but we don't have much knowledge about uh, tongues or we don't have much knowledge about prophecy but when we learn from god's word right it equips us what is the meaning of equip okay now i understand i know how to use it and if there is somebody else who needs to learn from it i can share okay come on this verse says like this about tongues so this is what it means you know don't be afraid it's a gift from god so whatever we know we are able to teach others you know this kind of a journey we are able to make in the lord and it's very very important for every believer it's not just you know i want to go to bible college so that i can become a pastor no but this is the life of a believer throughout to learn about god to to draw closer to god to serve god in whichever calling that he has given us so that's the reason you know equipping people of a church it's so important and you see barnabas and saul doing that so i told you church of antioch so unique it was planted after persecution people got scattered some believers planted it and at the same time you know there was a team ministry and investment of the word of god for a long period of time so let's stop here we will come back and we will continue we'll discuss a little more about the church of antioch and move on to what are the other things that took place so at this point we will just close with a word of prayer uh and uh, you know once again i just want to ask kiran kiran can you please pray and uh, we will close out today yes ma'am yeah father god we just come before your throne once again father god for thanking you for that today's teaching father god thanking you that all revelation father god father god help us to understand and help us to uh, apply to our life father god the kingdom journey father god help us to every way father god father god thanking you to nancy ma'am and all student father god thanking you for the today's teaching father thanking you upcoming time i'm just submitting to your hand father god father god take care of our this side thanking you father god Almighty Jesus, then we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Kiran. And class, I'm so sorry because of my cold. I think it was a little disruptive, the first session and the second. But uh, yeah, sorry about that. I hope you can still learn uh, something from these sessions. Okay. God bless you. Have a good day. Bye for now. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.